And uh, we are introduced most of the time these days as Scott Pauley's daddy. And, uh, but uh, we do have a daughter, Stacy, and her husband, Ty, has been on staff at Cranberry Baptist for 22 years. And she plays the piano, teaches at Victory Baptist Academy. And so sometimes when we're on that side of town, we're introduced to Stacy's mom and dad. And uh, but now we have grandchildren. We have six grandchildren. How many have grandchildren? Let's see, would you raise your hand? Isn't that wonderful? You know, your grandchildren is your reward for not killing your children. <laughs> and uh, we thank the Lord for our grandchildren. And uh, now Scott is a pawpaw. And so we are a great grandma and grandpa. We've been great all these years, but we've just been told uh, that we're now great grandparents and we're loving that part of our life as well. And so we ask that you continue to pray for us. And uh, I did not begin in the ministry. I started out in sales for a number of years. And right in the middle of the career, God called us to preach when I was 33. And then when I was 38, then we came pastor, became pastor of the Cranberry Baptist Church. Amen. Ironically, my father pastored there uh, from 1949 to 55. And my two older brothers were both saved at Cranberry. And uh, one brother has been pastor in the same church in Kannapolis, North Carolina for 52 years. And then my oldest brother is a deacon at our church. And uh, we praise the Lord for that and for our family and for what God is doing and for what he's yet to do yes, in the sir. days ahead. And so I followed the man that followed my daddy. And he was there for 34 years, the, the previous pastor. We were there for 33. And we're just thanking the Lord that there is life after pastorate as well. And we've had the opportunity the, these last several months to preach out several times. And we thank the Lord again for this opportunity. Amen. Our Bibles are open tonight to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Yes. Hebrews chapter 10. We find, I believe, the Apostle Paul was the writer. There's some debate about that. But uh, this is a letter of encouragement to these Jewish Christians who were under great persecution. As we look at this important text tonight, we want to cover... Uh, three different things, obvious exhortations given by the writer. Uh, before he pronounces the truth of these appeals, Paul, uh, in summary of this, restates what's been accomplished in every believer's uh, life by the offering, the final sacrifice uh, for our sins, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad that when he cried from the cross, it is finished, uh, that it's paid in full. Would you say amen to that? Amen. And there's nothing that I need to do to earn salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so we find in this passage of Scripture, picking up in verse number 19 of Hebrews 10, the writer says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, notice what he says in verse number 22, and for our text tonight, we'll pick these three phrases up. We find a threefold invitation in this passage of Scripture that rests completely on uh, the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. An open invitation uh, that we can come into the very presence of a holy God. Would you read with me verse 22 down through verse number 24? Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. When I read this last verse here, we recognize that these are troubled days in which we live. And there's no question about it. As I look back over our life, we've been married for 50 years this past August. And I look back over these last 50 years, how much life has changed and what our children have grown up in and now what our grandchildren are growing up in. It is a different world in which we live. Yes. But I believe, knowing that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. He said, I am the Lord thy God, I change not. Amen. 
Men may change, government may change, ideas may change, philosophies may change, politics even is changing, but we understand God never changes. Praise God that we have the assurance that God is still seated on the right hand of the throne of God, the Lord Jesus Christ making intercession for us. But as we read this passage of Scripture, I want you to notice again, as you look closer, we recognize these three invitations. Actually, they encompass three vital responsibilities of every child of God. Notice when he says, let us draw near. Can you say that with me? Let us draw near. And would you write out from that, exhorting God's people to come together to worship him. Let us draw near. Thank God for a, a good Bible-believing church that you're a part of. Thank God for the witness that it has in this community and for a man of God who stands for the truth without compromise. Let us draw near, he says, exhorting God's people then to worship together, to come together in one mind and one accord. Secondly, he says, let us hold fast. Here he's exhorting God's people to witness together, to go out and share the gospel, the good news to a lost and dying world. And we all have that responsibility, yea, a privilege to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, let us consider one another, exhorting God's people uh, to work together. What the writer is actually saying in this passage of Scripture is clear. Uh, would you notice, first of all, let us draw near with a true heart. Would you underscore that? A true heart. Uh, what the Lord Jesus Christ desires that we do, that all men come to the place of repentance in their life, all come to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. Yes, but once we trust Him as our Savior... He desires that we keep on coming. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, he says, If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The Lord says, I want you to keep on coming. You see, it's not a place of complacency. It should not be a place that we're satisfied. It should be, again, that we desire to draw closer to the Lord Jesus Christ and to be more like Christ and let Christ's life shine through us that we can win a lost and dying world world, not only to encourage our family, not only again to be a witness to our neighbors, but for our Jerusalem that God has given each of us. David asked the important question as he moves forward in the great work of rebuilding the temple. And the Bible reminds us in 1 Chronicles 29 verse 5, and he says this, who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? Can you say that with me? Who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? Let's try it again. Who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? And the Lord again desires that we be set apart from something in the world to someone, the Lord Jesus Christ. He desires again that we keep coming, consecrating ourselves again for the word of God to be shared with others. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1, the apostle Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your what? your reasonable service. He's saying there that it's God's desire that we consecrate ourselves completely to the Lord Jesus Christ and to be used by him. And again, he says, that is your reasonable service. I grew up in a preacher's home. I have several uncles that are preachers. I come from a good lineage as far as grandparents. My grandfather led the singing at the Union Gospel Mission Church in Ironton, Ohio until he was 94 years of age and went home to be at the Lord at 98. I have uncles that are preachers and lots of cousins that are preachers. I'm not sure if I have any aunts that are preachers. I may have, uh, but I don't know about them. But at any rate, I, I grew up in the church. And through all of that, I recognized as an 18-year-old boy that I had just been a church member, that I had just been a preacher's kid, that I had just been one uh, who was drugged to church. I was raised on drugs. I was drugged to church on Sunday morning, drug on Sunday night, drug on Wednesday night, and every night a revival. I remember my daddy started uh, the, the church in Milton, just down the road here, the Bethel Baptist Church, uh, when I was in like the second grade. 
And I remember they set up a big tent in that lot before there was a building there. They set up a tent and the revival went for six weeks, six weeks. And guess what? We went to church every night for six weeks, seeing under that tent people coming to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Oh, what a testimony that there's a church there now. Again, all because someone dedicated themselves to yield to the Lord and be obedient to Him. Thank God for it. And so I was raised in church and I was around church, as I said, all of my life. But I recognized after high school when I was 18 years of age through a chain of events that all I was was a church member and all I was was a preacher's kid and from a preacher's family and trying to live up to someone else's expectations. And it was that night that the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and I recognized for the first time that I was just religious, but I was not born again. And I went forward and asked Jesus Christ to come into my life. He changed my life forever. I have the, uh, the privilege of my daddy baptizing me when I was seven years age in a pond down here in Milton, West Virginia with two of my buddies. But I, I realized that baptism follows salvation. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward change. And I realized then that my life had changed drastically. And so I followed the Lord in believer's baptism. Little did I know in just the next few months that God would place this precious lady across my path. We met in church and sat in church. I was 19 at that time and she was 15. And I said real quick when Stacy, our daughter, turned 15, that it'll be a cold day where the booger man lives before a 19-year-old knocks on these doors. How many of our fathers in here say amen to that, right? Yeah. But I'm glad that, that the Lord put Marsha and I together she didn't marry a preacher. She married a salesman. Uh, but we just got in church and stayed in church and served the Lord in church. And again, the Lord says, if any man come after me, yeah. let him deny himself, take up his cross, follow me, follow me. Consecrate it ourselves to the Lord. What's consecration means? Separation from something to someone, yes, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And so may I say and challenge all of us in this room that all of us, the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance yes, but once we come to know Christ as our Savior the Lord says I want you to keep on coming I want you to keep on drawing near to me I want you to consecrate yourself to the Lord for his service that doesn't mean that everyone's going to be in full-time service that doesn't mean that we're all going to be missionaries it doesn't mean that all is going to be preachers but it does mean that we're all to be workers in the vineyard God wants to use all of us. Thus, we remind it again in this passage of Scripture. As a follower of Christ, may we examine our commitment yes, and may we be willing again to consecrate our service unto uh, the Lord uh, that we would draw closer uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. When we talk about this word examine, we find in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 28, the Bible says, but let a man examine himself. You see, the Lord desires that we would consecrate ourselves with a pure heart and a clear conscience. May I ask this question? Are you as close to the Lord tonight, this very hour, as you were the first day that you trusted Christ as your Savior? That's a wonderful question to ask all of us. For we realize that if we're not as close, that means that we've not just stood still, we've actually gone backwards. And as a Christian, he desires that we continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. And again, to keep on coming. And so examine himself. Examine is a mortifier that is taken from the goldsmiths who try the truth of their gold by the touchstone. Touchstones, excuse me. Testing the purity of their gold with fire and by the weight on the scale. Is this gold genuine? May I say, I want to be a touchstone Christian. I want the Lord again to know that I not only trusted him as my Savior, but I've yielded myself to him and allow Christ again to use us in our life. And so the Lord called us to the church. The first seven or eight years, seven years we were by vocation and then we went full time and the Lord is blessed in a wonderful way. But I recognize uh, looking back that God still has something else that he wants us to do. You see, it all goes back to this, to choices that we make. You're right. Choices that we make. Again, Joshua says, choose you this day as to whom you'll serve. And then he says, as for me and my house, we will what? Serve the Lord. I heard this said many years ago, Pastor, 
Someone said to me, the choices we make today determine who we are tomorrow. Yes. That indeed is a good question and a good statement. But watch this. I would say and testify that the choices we make today also determine who our children are tomorrow. You see, the Lord again desires that we would not only come to him for conversion, but he says again, I want you to be consecrated unto me and willingly and to follow me. You know, there are a lot of Christians that seemingly know Christ or people that are church members that seemingly know Christ. But oftentimes, they're just playing church. I remember as a, as a kid, preacher's kid, you know, sometimes we would play marbles and sometimes we'd play cars and sometimes we'd play tag or hide and seek and all of those games. Kids today have no idea what that is unless it's on some video game. But I remember us playing church a lot when I was a kid. And I remember my brother, Eddie, he had to be the sinner every time and get right with the Lord. And then we would baptize him in a mud puddle or something, you know. But the truth of it is, I believe there's a lot of people today that are just playing church. Just playing church. Do you know what an Alka-Seltzer Christian is? Once you put them in the water, they fizzle for a little bit, but then they, many of them fizzle out. They draw back. Why do they draw back? Satan's attack will come up against us. The cares of this world offended in church by someone else or preacher didn't shake my hand or preacher didn't speak to me today or he's showing favoritism or someone else has treated me wrong, whatever the case may be. Somebody sat in my seat. Have you ever heard that one? Or they didn't recognize me or they didn't call on me or they didn't give me credit for what I've been doing. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is, we would say, but there's plop, plop, fizz, fizz, and they just fizzle out, and you wonder, whatever happened? I believe if they get a good dose of salvation, may I say, they'll desire to consecrate themselves unto the Lord, and again, that we would lose our own feelings and lose our own opinions and lose again all of the, the things that we compete for in this life and just look to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Let us draw near with a true heart. He's talking about a consecrated heart. He's talking about God's people who are devoted and de dedicated and sanctified by the master for the master's use. God wants to use all of us. Would you say amen? There's not one person under the sound of my voice and in the part of this church here in, in this valley to understand this, that God has a place for every one of us. God wants to use all of us. If any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And secondly, would you look here in this passage of Scripture when he says, let us draw near with a true heart. He's speaking of a consecrated heart. And secondly, would you notice in verse number 23, and he says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. He's speaking about not just a consecrated heart, but a confident heart. These things I write unto you, he says, that you sin not. We understand again that as a Christian, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. He reminds us that this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he what? He heareth us. Yes, he does. We're talking about not just a consecrated heart, but a confident heart. Would you turn back to Hebrews chapter 3 and notice in this passage of Scripture, verse number 14. And the Bible says, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our, what does it say? Confidence steadfast unto the end. Notice he has in this passage of scripture not only this confidence that we hold to the end, but look in chapter 6 and verse number 19. And the Bible says, which hope we have, what does it say? As an anchor of the soul. Would you say those next two words with me? Both what? Both sure and steadfast. Yeah. And which entereth into the that within the veil. He says again, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Yeah. 
Not only a consecrated heart, but a confident heart. Knowing that it's in him that we live, move, and have our being. And to know that it's not a guess-so salvation. It's not a hope-so salvation. It is a no-so salvation. These things I write unto you that you sin not, he says. But he goes on and reminds us that you may know, that you may know. Uh, when you read 1 John, you find the number of no's uh, that he reminds us in that passage of Scripture. It is indeed a no-so salvation. Christians are bombarded every day by the onslaught of Satan himself. And Daddy used to say, if the devil never bothers you, indeed, he already has you. So he's always coming up against yes, us. I promise you, the devil doesn't like it when people come to know the Lord. The devil doesn't like it when the truth of God's word is preached without compromise. The devil doesn't like it when you witness to someone else, a friend, a neighbor, or even a loved one that comes to know Christ as a Savior, and he's going to come up against you every way that he possibly can. The onslaught of the devil. Therefore, we must be able to guard constantly as we yield ourselves to the Spirit of God in our daily walk with God. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 reminds us, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so we look back over our lives. The day that I nailed it down, then was married four years later. We decided when we got married that what God had done, he had put us together. And God had a plan and a purpose for our life. And we recognized when the children came along that God gave us this wonderful gift. You know what I'm talking about, amen? And God gives us this wonderful gift of a child, a boy and a girl, and gave us the responsibility to train them up in the way that they should go. All of us have a great responsibility indeed, but what a privilege it is. And then again, to see your children serving the Lord, there's absolutely nothing like it. Would you say amen? Absolutely nothing like it. And that does not happen by accident, but it's by, again, not only coming to the Lord and having full confidence of salvation, but a time in our life when we've consecrated ourselves completely to the Lord. Now let us hold fast. He reminds us the profession of our faith with a confident heart, knowing that the devil is going to come up against us every way he can. Would you agree that there are many Christians who say they're Christians and yet you never see them in church? You would think on any day that they would come to church, maybe not revival, but surely they'd come on the Lord's Day. This coming Sunday being Easter, there'll be many that'll come. And maybe they've had some experience in their life. Maybe they've gone through some trial. Could it be that the devil has defeated them? Maybe they have never even been born again. But I'm sure when they come to the house of the Lord and like a place like this to hear the songs of praising that he's alive forevermore and that it's in him that we live, move, and have yes, our being yes. and the word of God is preached. His word will not return void. We have an opportunity this week to invite folks to come to church, there's no question about it. Probably better than any other day of the year is Easter. I know there's a lot of good days to come. But some would give you the excuse, well, if I was going to go, it wouldn't be on Easter. That's when everybody else comes. But what a day as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. We're reminded again through the Word of God that we're to hold our, this profession of our faith and again with a confident heart. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 10, Paul reminds young Timothy, you have known persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and at Iconium and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all, he said, the Lord delivered me. I promise you we could go around the room and all of us have gone through trials. All of us have gone in, down through the valley, even the valley of the shadow of death of burying loved ones. All of us have faced something, some crisis in our life. I do not know what people do when they go through the valleys and when they go through the hard times, what they do who do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's right. Aren't you glad that he's there not only to be our comforter, he's there again to be our guide, he's there to be our counselor, he's there again to guide us through whatever that we're going through in our life. We have someone that we can turn to. 
And as we recognize the Lord Jesus Christ has promised us that he'd never leave us nor forsake us, it should allow us again that opportunity to grow in the Lord when we go through difficult times in our life. It could be in this room tonight that there's one that's going through difficult times or, old, or the old devil has come against you. And Daddy used to say again, if the devil never bothers you, he's already got you. And it could be that someone in this room is facing some of those trials that the devil is fighting you, but again, the Lord has never left you. Maybe you're guessing whether you've ever been saved or not. First John chapter 5, by the way, that's a great book to read for assurance of salvation, First John. First John chapter 5, verse 14 says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, knowing again that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. John 15, verse 16, That whatsoever you shall ask of my Father in my name, he may give it you. Timothy reminds us, or Paul reminds young Timothy, You have known persecutions and these afflictions, he says, but God will deliver you out of them all. Would you agree with me that many people who claim to know Christ claim to be Christians and they never come to the house of the Lord except maybe that one day of the year as we said a moment ago. May I say, someone said this many times, many, many years ago, Dr. Adrian Rogers. He said, most people around the world go three times a year or three times in their lifetime to church. When they're born at dedication or christened, when they got married, and then for their own funeral. So Dr. Adrian Rogers said these are the people who only attend when they're hatched, matched, and dispatched. How true it is. The only time they ever come to the house of the Lord. There have always been those who would follow Christ for some other reason and then draw back like Demas. There are many Christians who are faithful to the Lord for many years, but when they go through those valleys or they go through that persecution, then they too draw back. As a pastor for 33 years and three months to be exact, I could almost count you the days. What a blessing again to pastor a church of godly people, but like any church, you're always going to have something going on. And the devil's always going to be fighting all that he can. But as a pastor, I've witnessed countless numbers of family who I believe that are, have been born again. But they got so caught up in the cares of this world. You can look around and no doubt think about people that should be here tonight. And probably one of the worst things for a pastor to do before the church starts or while the choir is singing, we're sitting in the pastor's chair and looking back over the congregation we're thankful for all that are here, but oftentimes it's very easy to do, isn't it, preacher? It starts going through your mind, right, Brother Chad? It starts going through your mind of those that should be here, but they're not here. And many times, even in the pew, you cannot enjoy the service because those who you love and those who you care about and those friends are, are not here. And we think about it all the time. Why are they not here? Why are they not here? Uh, let me just give you a list of a lot of reasons that were given or excuses. Many times, families get so caught up in what they call family time or the kids' sports programs, schedules, activities, careers, money, and the next thing you know, they too have found themselves out of church. Unfortunately, a lot of these people have lost their children to the world, and now we have the regrets to this day. I've actually had people over the years again say this to me, if I just had it to do over again, if I just had it to do over again. Now, as I stand before you, if I could go back and do some things over in my life, I promise you I would do it. And we could go around the room and we'd all raise our hand and say, yes, if I had an opportunity to do that one over again, I would do differently. But aren't you thankful for God's grace? Aren't you thankful again for God's power that allows us to look back and learn from our yesterdays and to know again that all that I have today is legal tender, is today. Yesterday is a canceled check. Tomorrow, a promissory note. All I have that is legal tender is this day. And the question is, what am I going to do with this day? What am I going to do? There are many things that we could ask questions and ask about. We can ask Google. 
I probably talk to Siri more now than I do my own wife, truth. That's not good. That's not good. But many times, if we want to find an answer today, we just Google it. We just Google it. We just Google it. I want you to know the best place to find answers is right here in the Word of God. I promise you. This is the place to find the answers. No doubt over the centuries of time, there have been those, again, that had some emotional, mental decisions uh, just to join the church. Many have come, no doubt, and made a decision to join the church to save their home or save their job or uh, to save, again, their children or to clean up their life. But unfortunately, a lot of these peoples are, people are just church members and have never been born again. Now, I believe this with all my heart, that there are those who come to the end of themselves and God's brought them there and allowed them to go there and he gets their attention. And I remember this in my own life through a chain of events, that God brought me to the end of myself as a young man after high school, searching for what true meaning of life was all about and thought as long as I had a fast car and could run out to the drag strip every now and then or get a, a race going on the highway, and uh, have a little girl or in the car with me from time to time, I thought, boy, I, I've really got it going. But I realized real quick, that's a dead end. That's a dead end. And God brought me to the end of myself as an 18-year-old boy who'd been out of high school for a year that I was headed the wrong direction. I'm glad that the Lord Jesus Christ is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. And oftentimes, God allows circumstances in our life to get us to that place of coming to Him for salvation. But wait a minute. Then God allows us again to follow Him and to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. But keep this in mind. God desires uh, that we be obedient to Him. Not only in our Bible reading, our prayer life, and church attendance, and witnessing, and giving. We could talk about those five things and go over and over again. But He just wants us to be obedient to Him and what we know to do. And He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. Amen. And as we yield ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ, God again continues to draw us close to himself and open again avenues for us to be used by him. And so we've talked thus far that when we talk about knowing Christ, he desires a committed heart, a committed heart. Notice the scripture, let us draw near. We can be as close to the Lord as we desire to be. Right. He desires this commitment. Then he says, not only let us draw near, but he says, let us hold fast. He wants not only a committed heart, but a confident heart yeah. to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's not guess so, hope so, or maybe so, but a know so. Salvation, that's so important. And then lastly, he says in this passage of scripture that we hold fast, no doubt, that we draw near, but he said, let us consider, let us consider. Would you go back to our text in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 10, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart. Would you say there with me, a committed heart? Would you say it with me, committed heart? Committed heart. Then notice in verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith, a confident heart. Can you say it? A confident heart. And then in verse 24, and let us consider one another. No man lives to himself and no man dies to himself. God desires again that we would yield to him. There's no question about it. But he also desires that we would live for others. This little poem, no doubt you've heard. I came across this many years ago. It's just simply entitled Others. Lord, help me to live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer shall be for others. Help me in all the work I do to ever be sincere and true and know that all I'll do for you must needs be done for others. Let self be crucified and slain and buried deep. Let's all in vain. May efforts be to rise again and less to live for others. And when my work on earth is done and my new work in heaven begun, may I forget the crown of one while thinking still of others. Would you say it with me? Others, Lord, others. others. Let this my motto be, others, Lord, others, that I may live like thee.
the Lord desires again that we just live again for others. Exhorting one another, the Bible reminds us, to provoke them unto good works. In verse number 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Exhorting, he's talking about encouraging. How? By having a compassionate heart, about being considerate, and calls again us to be faithful, not only to our family, but also to our friends. Jude 22, you know the verse. And of some have compassion, making a difference. I desire to make a difference in life, not only to our own family, but those that we come in contact with. I have no idea what lies ahead of us, how many years God will allow us, but it's our desire again to just live for the Lord Jesus Christ, that we be a witness to a lost and dying world. It should be again the desire of all of our hearts. I want to make a difference. How about you? Make a difference in someone else's life. And so we see it clearly about being considerate, being thoughtful or caring. May I say, this is a commandment, the Lord says, that you love one another as I have loved you. So when you look at this text in Hebrews chapter 10, underscore it, let us draw near with a true heart. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. And let us consider one another, living for others, and more importantly, living for the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. A committed heart, we find it there. A confident heart with full assurance. Sure. But also to have a compassionate heart. I'm glad someone had compassion on me. And shared with me the gospel. And we can make a difference in other people's lives. Our heads are bowed as we stand to our feet. The pastor's going to come in just a moment. But in this great auditorium this evening I believe the Lord Jesus Christ has met with us and the Lord desires again to work in all of our hearts as Christians that we indeed would draw closer to him how many in this room tonight would say preacher first of all the most important question do you know if you were to die right now that you know that heaven would be your home how many could raise your hand with mine just give the Lord a praise while you raise your hand and say, thank you, Lord, for salvation. All over this room, our hands are going up. What a wonderful, beautiful sight. And praise God for that. But as we raise our hands, we realize that God wants to use us. Not only, again, through this commitment that we have to him and that he has to us, that he would never leave us, but that we would desire to be used by him. And God has spoken to your heart about someone could be family, could be friends, could be co-workers or neighbors or people in general. That your desire, again, is to make a difference in someone else's life by what they see in your own life. Would you raise your hand with mine all over this room? You have a desire for that. All over this room, hands are going up. Let's find us a place around the altar and ask God again to draw us close to himself and to be used by him and pray for those family members and friends and co-workers and neighbors who do not know the Lord. You may be the only Bible indeed that's, that's often been said that people will ever read. May they see a difference in our life. How many in this room would say, Preacher, as a Christian, I've been going through some difficult days. I've been discouraged. And I ask that you pray for me. And just by an uplifted hand, no one's looking around. The pastor, no doubt, is aware of some of these things. God bless you all over the room. Say, please pray for me. We've been going through some difficult days. God knows all about it. Why don't you find your place around this altar as well as we pray. Those who raise their hand, maybe you're praying for someone else, praying for family. Would you step out and come even before we pray? Father, bless now, I pray, this great church. Thank you, Lord, for the light, not only in this community, in this state, but around the country. Thank you for this dear pastor for these many years that he's served faithfully and the dedication to this church and for what you're doing in the days ahead and the years to come. And I pray now, Lord, for all that's in this auditorium tonight. Help us, Lord, just to yield ourselves to you, to consecrate ourselves unto the Lord Jesus Christ and to be used by you. Pray for folks who are praying for, we pray for folks who, who are lifting up others who do not know Christ and want to be used by you. And pray for those who are not where they need to be. 
Pray for those who have some burden or some trial, some heartache, whatever the case may be. Lord, we pray that they would meet this with you. And God, knowing that you're able to meet every need according to your perfect will. We love you. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. In Jesus' name, Pastor.